So it's uh, Romans chapter 10, and uh, we need to understand that uh, as Paul was growing up, uh, he experienced, you know, the Jewish culture of uh, being separated from non-Jews. So if you're a Jew, you would understand that you have special covenant, there are special promises, you have special relationship with God. And Gentiles, they don't have all that stuff. They are not circumcised uh, as part of the you know, Mosaic covenant. They, they don't have all the beautiful promises. They are not part of Jewish community, right? So, but when Jesus comes, we see that some Jews accept Jesus as the Messiah, as some don't. And even Paul wouldn't accept Jesus at first as the Messiah. It's only that Jesus, when Jesus revealed himself on Paul's road to Damascus, right? When Paul had this conversion experience, we, he met Jesus, he was blind, he didn't eat for three days. He was basically dead, right? And then he was kind of like reborn he could see and he started preaching about Jesus right away, right? Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus is the Messiah. Now, if you look at the book of Acts, you see that Paul is traveling from place to place. But first, first thing he does in each new place, he goes to the local synagogue and he preaches about Jesus and uh, some Jews accept Jesus as the Messiah, but some don't. And this is a big question for Paul. He has quite a few years of ministry, right? But this is a big question why some Jews, fellow Jews, don't accept Jesus as the Messiah. What will happen to them? Those who accept, okay, but those who don't. And it looks like he is very concerned about that. And at the same time, he realizes, and we see many verses, uh, in the Old Testament that God is not just God of Israel, he is God of all nations. And when the Messiah comes, then all nations will come and kneel before him. So, which means that for Paul it's clear that what Jesus has done is not just for Jews, it's also for all the nations, right? So, but how can you balance this, you know, Jews who have special covenants and promises, and Gentiles who don't have all that stuff, right? So we see that the first half of his epistle, he is pushing really hard that Gentiles can be saved. And he would say, well, you're not Jew if you are just circumcised or if you are born, if your genes are Jewish, right? It's what, it, it, is, what, is, it is, what is in your heart. If you have faith in Jesus, he says, well, you, your heart is circumcised, right? And you're a true Jew. Just based on spiritual stuff, right? Not just physical stuff. And Paul makes a very strong case that Gentiles can be part of the church. That Jesus died for the Gentiles as well, and that Gentiles can be saved as well. And it looks like that in the middle of his epistle, he, he swings back. Now he says, now, but Jews do not disrespect them. Because I can see how Gentiles could easily look down on those Jews who do not accept Jesus, right? And then Paul says, no, 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 wait. Do not hurry with your conclusions. God has his own plan for them, right? So now we can see how he is making case that those Jews who do not believe in Jesus will ultimately somehow believe in him or maybe their descendants will believe in him. So uh, it's very interesting to see how the, you know, I mean, to us, I don't know if it is relevant to us today, this problem, right? We don't think about ourselves versus Jews, right? We kind of like, okay, Jesus died for all. We, we, we don't draw any lines. But for him, 
it was like huge topic. Because, you know, Jews wouldn't eat with Gentiles, would not associate with them. They would build their houses uh, uh, in a separate uh, area, right? So they, they would separate themselves from the rest of the people. Some Jews didn't, and they would become very uh, quickly uh, pagans, I would say. So some Jews, we know, they would worship idols, uh, ancient idols, like uh, so Egyptians' idols. But we can also see uh, that, you know, during the time of Paul, uh, some Jews would worship philosophers and, uh, you know, Greek gods, and evil, even will try to undo their circumcision, you know by using special devices, you know, it's, uh... <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so let us see how Paul addresses this. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them, for uh, Jews, is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God but not according to knowledge, for being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. He's trying to explain why Jews are having difficulty accepting Jesus, right? So they believe that they can uh, achieve salvation or be righteous uh, just relying on their own efforts, right? And he says, no, they missed, they don't understand it. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes, and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then? Will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have. For their voice has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. But I ask, did Israel not understand? First Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation, with a foolish nation I will make you angry. Then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask me. But of Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Okay, so uh, again, he repeats the same idea several times in this epistle, 
that you can be saved even without fulfilling the law of Moses. You can be saved. So this is what he says. Well, and he relies uh, on this fact that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So now, when we think about salvation in the scripture, uh, people wanted to know how, how can you be sure that you are saved? And they were looking at all the passages about salvation. And it turns out that sometimes it says you are saved. Sometimes it says you are being saved. And sometimes it says you will be saved. So, and then it's like, you know, the process, right? So you are saved, you are being saved, and you will be saved. Which means that the way of salvation uh, consists of several components. And we spoke with you about this, and I will say it again. So we have two things in our salvation. It's justification and sanctification. Justification is legal term. Legal. So, and you don't need to do anything to be justified. You just need to do what Paul says here. Believe that Jesus died for you, right? He was raised from the dead, right? So uh, you, you, you confess him as your Lord and you believe that he died, that he was raised. So just by having this faith, this conviction, right, and confessing it, you are justified. But your way of salvation doesn't stop there, right? So then you become his child. And as his child, you are supposed to grow in your knowledge of Jesus Christ, right? So you are supposed to uh, allow the Holy Spirit to lead you, guide you, and teach you. You are supposed to drown your old Adam, so that your old Adam diminishes, right? So this is the process of sanctification. In other words, this is how we live our life with Jesus now, right? So... And the Holy Spirit is working in us and is transforming us and so is helping us to crucify the old Adam, the sinful nature. So in all that, in our Christian way of salvation, there is no place for, okay, you need to do these rituals and you will be saved, right? For Jews, that was uh, reality. You need to come to the temple on certain days and you were supposed to make certain sacrifices, right? This is how you uh, become righteous, right? This is how you, you, you just do certain things. So, and here, it's not just about doing, it's what's in your heart. And then... Uh, we know that people can easily lie, or you, people can be like superficial. They may say that they believe in Jesus, but they do not mean it, right? So that is why you will see that uh, Paul is talking not just about words. He's talking about transformation. That's, yes, you will confess that Jesus is the Lord, but you also will be transformed. Right? Because now the Holy Spirit lives in you. So it's not just uh, empty statements, right? Uh, I believe in Jesus and, you know, there is no fruit. Luther would say if you just make empty statements, this is not a saving faith. Th this is not a saving faith because saving faith uh, produces fruit. You know, saving faith... And, and, and uh, Luther, L Lutherans would be uh, uh, accused right away by the Roman Catholic theologians. Oh, you just preach faith without word, works. But Luther says, no, 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 good works are necessary, but they will flow naturally if you have saving faith, right? And then Lutheran theologians would say, if you do not have 
good works. That is a sign that you do not have saving faith. Right? You, you cannot have saving faith without naturally producing good works. So, and what people do, uh, and I think Satan is deceiving many people here, they think that if just they just proclaim, you know, make these statements without truly bearing fruit, that they are still okay with God. So... Can you, can you say uh, any words about deeds of law and deeds of faith? Differences? Yeah, the, the deeds of law... Uh, well, it's uh, uh, performing, you know, it's performing rituals. <coughs> and deeds of faith, it will be... Uh, and for salvation. Uh, yeah, it will be uh, uh, obedience to the Lord. It will be you love the Lord, you want to follow Him, you don't want to dis displease Him, right? You want to please the Lord. So th these are two different directions. And the deeds of law, it just doesn't matter what is in your heart, just do the right thing, right? And that's all. And, uh, and, and Paul finishes here, he says uh, uh, that, yeah, uh, we can see that foolish nation... This is us, who is not a nation, fool, foolish nation. This is all of us. These are not foolish because you don't know God, right? So all the foolish nations. Uh, but the Lord still calls you to salvation. And then in chapter 11, he will say, Hey, you foolish nation, you who is saved by faith, do not look down uh, on Jews who are not saved yet. So he will try to, I can, I can see, because you know, the first Christian communities, they had tensions, because they had Christians who are Jews, and they have Christians who are Gentiles. And some Christians who are Jews, they would insist on their superiority in a way, and Gentiles will push back. And Paul interferes, and he's trying to say, no, 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 God accepts Gentiles. But then he talks, it's like he's talking to Jews. He says, dear Jews, Christian Jews, God accepts Gentiles. And then he turns to Gentiles, and he says, dear Gentiles, do not look down on Jews. You know, he's trying to kind of reconcile them. So it didn't work very well. They... they <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's right. It's important that we continue to speak the word of Christ mm -hmm. and from the Bible. And it's like verse 17, faith comes from hearing and they hear it through the word of Christ. Yeah, and if how can they believe if they haven't heard? <laughs> you know, so that is why when, it, when I'm thinking about the state of Christianity, say, in the West, and particularly in the United States, when I talk to uh, pastors from different denominations, everybody would, almost everyone would mention that uh, one of the biggest problems nowadays is biblical illiteracy, that people don't know the scriptures. And we know how it happened. Uh, after the Second World War, we see that churches started bleeding, losing people. And then pastors were trying to find ways to bring them back. And I spoke to such a pastor, Lutheran pastor, who is retiring soon. And he told me that the Bible is boring, and the Lutheran confessions are boring, and that I need to tell jokes and stories. And I'm like, really? How did you come to this idea, right? So, but if there are pastors like that who think that, you need to come up with, uh, you know, all the creative stories. And, uh, and, and some of them, I read those books. You know, some of them tell you, you need to learn from uh, Hollywood movies, how they do, like, intro. And, you know, uh, you know you, 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 and, 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 and I can imagine how this shift happened from the Bible, you know, studying the scripture, knowing the word of God, to trying to find ways to attract people somehow. 
you know, telling stories, maybe music, maybe, you know, all kinds of things, right? So... When, uh, when we're telling this, I'm asking myself, what makes me uh, hungry, what makes me desire to read the Bible? And I found two things. I want to know God more, his character, to connect with him. And second, I want to be sanctified. I know without reading the Bible, it's like mirror. And it's uh, the book of wisdom. Of wisdom of what? How to live with God. How to be sanctified. This is the wisdom with, uh, which the world doesn't have. And if you don't need that, this book is really uh, boring. It's really boring. Because you, if you don't want insane. relationship, if you don't want relationship with yeah, God, you don't need that. The, the, you, need, you need something else. Yeah. So, if you have that, so, you so, so which brings us back to the fact that uh, mentioned Randy that it is important, as Paul says, to preach the word of God. On Thursday, last not last one Thursday ago, we had a speaker here at St. John from Trinity. Uh, biblical College, so Guy, uh, Jeff attended. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And he uh, was sharing, we were talking about apologetics and reaching out to generation, all the new generations, and he says, well, forget about middle-aged people and even students. We already lost them. If you want to build church in the 21st century, you need to do children's ministry. And baby boomers. He said reach out to baby boomers. Baby boomers because you can still talk to them. They still can have all, you know, all the basic notions in order. They're not confused. So... He said boomers because boomers are starting to figure out that, hey, we screwed up. Yeah. And they're taking their grandkids to the church. Amen. <laughs> and great grandkids, yeah. So, and, and then he says, well, we need to focus on kids. I personally like working with students and, you know, young adults. So, but, but his information uh, made me rethink it. He says, because even, you know, students, it's good to work with students, but it's too late. I mean, we are already lost them. So, Sarah, 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 Sarah is listening to this. Not, not, all not all of them, not all of them. But what he says, he says very often we kind of think, well, kids' ministry is something like entertainment, not important. But he says, no, there is a, if we want to build church, we need to wor start working with, with kids seriously, seriously. Let, it, let us pray. Dear Jesus, we are so thankful to you for this conversation. We can uh, see, Jesus, how you are teaching us through the Word of God, the Holy Spirit, um, our testimonies, um, Brothers, sisters in Christ, Jesus bless this amazing fellowship and may it grow. Uh, in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.